Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Dr. Modi Friedman. He's an illustrator, an author, and an entrepreneur. Modi, welcome to Comic Culture. It's a pleasure to be here, Terrence. I've been watching this show quite a lot. and It's a thrill. Well, it's great having you here today. Um, you've been uh, an illustrator, and you've, your work has graced the covers of uh, Heavy Metal magazine. And well, I, I, I submitted some stuff to them. I don't want to give myself credit, and I've been did some work with the um, their managing editor. Okay, so yeah, but I've, I've done some covers in Israel and other stuff here. Yeah. So, can you tell us the difference between we talk mostly with comic artists who do sequential style uh, artwork? Right. How is that different from illustration, where we, we see a lot of the same elements, but instead of sequential, it's, it's maybe one more powerful image? Well, everything starts with story. Now, I'm, I'm also, you know, an aspiring comic book artist. I've uh, done with my wife, uh, Dr. Nogo Friedman, some children's book, uh, like Upside Down World, that, that you've known. Um, the, the difficult thing about sequential, I think it's more difficult than uh, just illustrating. Uh, that's the reason, you know, that if you look at all the comic book uh, publishers, they always say, please don't send, send us pinups. Show us a few pages, you know, uh, of sequential art. And sequential art is very difficult. You've noticed, you know, if you take your comic book, The Agreement, you know how difficult it is both to write. It has to be an integration of uh, words with uh, pictures. And it's not just the panels. It's the integration of the whole page as a whole. Now, when you do, I think that, um, when you do when you do uh, a good illustration, it has to have some story. It has to have some interest. If you're not talking about something that's you know completely abstract, right? So I think the real challenge to do sequential art, and that's, I admire you for it. It's not I've seen your your stuff, and I told you uh, before we started that it reminded me a lot of George Perez's work, which is uh, uh, one of my favorite of all time. And he was one willing, for example, to tackle group stuff, and not everybody's willing to do that. Um, the advantage of doing it one illustration is that, you know, you just focused on one picture. You should tell some sort of story, but there's no connection between two pictures. And, you know, all professional artists will tell you, I can tell when somebody's not professional, when they start asking me questions like, what do you start with? The eye, the nose, you know. Uh, if somebody, uh, you always should start with a holistic view. Like uh, Walt Simonson, who was on your show, explained that he used to have a structure that he had, which I loved. He had a whole structure. And I used to follow his Thor in the 80s. Uh, you know, he's trying to build a structure that's very, you know, kind of uh, sits on the bottom, like an architectural structure, and he built the whole page that way. That's the correct approach, the holistic approach to comic book. And th those are the best artists. That um, uh, Tom Dial, he showed you how things flow in a page. You know, that you, you know, we we if we're not as professional, then we don't notice it. And for these guys, it's already a second language. So illustration, I think, is is easier at the end of the day. I, I would I would have to say for me uh, sequential art is is a lot more rewarding than trying to do a cover because I know I'll struggle to get that one image just right because you have to capture the entire essence of a story in that one picture to as they say you know the the book is going to be sold by the cover um, so I, I know that you're you're talking about this holistic approach so when you're commissioned to to work on an illustration for a book or you read a book and decide this has inspired you to do this this drawing how do you uh, find, I guess, the gestalt of the image or the, the story that is going to be told in that one image? Well, let's start with the word research. I think that's very, very important. And the rule is, you know, in ISO 9000, you should always get three proposals. It's the same thing for art. Everything's the same. Do at least three different sketches. And um, I've, seen, I've heard it from a lot of artists. Your first idea is not always going to be your best. It could be. But try to do three different things. And... Um, you know, are you familiar with the gorilla story of the cover? I think you are, right? I'm not well, sure. DC, about 30, 40 years ago, I don't remember when it was, 60s, 70s, they did one cover with a gorilla on it. One of their books, I don't remember which one, had a gorilla. And it was a bestseller because it, was, it stood out. It was different. People were used to seeing superheroes jumping all over the place. How many times have you seen Batman scowling, Superman flying, you know, Fantastic Four, Thor, whatever, you know, newer stuff. Um, and all of a sudden there was a gorilla, you know, just in a zoo. It was a great seller. And then they started, they had a few years of gorilla covers. I was going to say, I, I recall that that would be when, you know, I guess, the Silver Age when you had Superman with a lion's head. Just, I guess, anything to sort of, it became a gimmick rather than a, a storytelling device. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a term in marketing called uh, uh, trade marketing, which is basically you want your products on the shelf to stick out. Comic books fall in that. Uh, red is the strongest color. 
So look behind you. There's new gods. There's a reason the the logo is in red, and and it takes about a third of the page. You want you want things to be read clearly and from far away. And even now that I'm talking from my iPhone to you, and you're and there's a cover behind you, I can easily read new gods. You know, it, it, there's a reason like that. And and I've seen a lot of people they do a uh, for example a logo on a on a, um on their cover that's beautiful it's really great drawing but it can be read it's not clear uh you have to, the rule is my wife always says that you should be able to read it on a business card that's a good logo mm -hmm. and if you can't read it on a business card you're not you're definitely not going to see it on the cover of a comic book or an illustration or a book or a children's book can you tell us a little bit about your process artistically um uh, we were talking a little bit before we started to record that you work digitally um whereas yeah. uh, some illustrators are are going out and they're still using pencil or pen or uh, or paint. So can you tell us about your process? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I, I did the old school and I used to do portraits and watercolor. Um, that was very helpful to me, a watercolor, because as everyone knows, you know, watercolor, you you can't work with just one level. You're working with several layers and layers and layers. So when I and I got into Photoshop many years ago, and under uh, Manga Studio, which is Manga Studio 5X now, and uh, you know they call it Clip Studio Art as well. And it doesn't cost a lot, and I love it for comic books. I do still use pen and paper, but you know for the sketches, for the thumbnails, stuff like that. So you get the flow. Um, then what I do is uh, research. Uh, being a market researcher or a business researcher, I find that you know there's today we're lucky. Today we have Google Images. You know, before you remember how we used to, you wanted an image of something, you had to start collecting books, you had to start uh, going to the library, and you and and then finding. Today you can just Google and, and get amazing pictures that you shouldn't copy one for one. That's a mistake I see a lot of artists to do. Um, um, you know, they swipe basically, and I've seen a lot of critique, rightfully so, on the internet. People saying, "Look, look at this guy who drew the X Men or whatever. He just copied up somebody from uh, some picture, some real uh, picture." Uh, I think these should be used as references for idea because they don't have the flow. Um, I'll explain what I mean. One of the things that, um, for example, one of the things that Bob McCloud taught me personally, and he uh, and he he he, made, he said to make things a bit extreme, you know, exaggerate. Um, and I think Bob is absolutely right, because in comic books, it's all about exaggeration. Larry Hamas, I recommend everyone read his 10 rules for drawing a comic book. And he says it's better to overact or underact. I think it's him or maybe it's Alex Toth, but it's true. You, you have to uh, research. And then what I do when I research and I get enough pictures, I try to get to set the mood of the book. Now, I believe I'm the one from the school of thought, like if, I, if I'm writing a book or a comic book or trying to write a comic book, um, you have to start with the overall story. You know, Larry Hammer said he, he couldn't do it. He would work, he said he would go uh, page by page. I'm, I'm, I'm personally preferred to know what the ending is and then work to it and then you can do foreshadowing and stuff like that. But you know, that's a personal preference. But you should have, then you should decide um, on the overall flow of the book. If you're doing a, a children's book, uh, one way to separate pages uh, is by different colors. So decide on the color scheme. And uh, too many colors are not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so you should decide for the next two pages is going to be very dark. And then the next two pages, it could be very light. And then people automatically, when they turn the page, they know that they're in another world. You know, if you look at uh, Alec, Alex Ross, he's, he, uh, some of his comic books are amazing because he works on a different color uh, page. So I, I try to integrate that in, in, into my digital work in the sense that I can advance what it's going to look like. Uh, what are my colors going to be? This comic book is going to be black and white. This one's going to be this color. Uh, this is going to be, uh, and it has to do with the story because everything's about storytelling. And I, I personally believe that the, the story should drive the art, not vice versa. Or the, mar or the goal. If you're doing an illustration and the goal is to sell a cover, and you're doing what everyone else is doing, then you're not going to stand out on the shelf. You're not going to stand out when people browse through the Internet, right? They're going to look at the same, and it's another picture. But if there's something unique about it, then it's going to stick out. People are going to be interested in looking at it. It's true. I think we do see a lot of covers now that um, aren't necessarily related to the <coughs> story. They're, they're uh, I guess, um, just pinups, what we used to call the pinups, the, the extra page at the back of the book when they didn't have a yeah. letter column or something. Uh, and the similarities in, in a lot of these covers... Um, and I don't want to say anything bad about this group of artists, but the, the image look in the, the early 90s, uh, they're now celebrating yeah. their 25th anniversary, if you can believe it, but a lot of those covers would, would be very cheesecake. Uh, and after a while, 
even that sort of image that's you know, eye-catching uh, to a particular audience, uh, that becomes a glut on the, the newsstand and you're not able to uh, differentiate one from the other. Um, but you know, in the old days when we look at a, a cover of, let's say, um, Crisis on the Infinite Earths number seven, right. when Supergirl is dead. Uh, that was amazing. It, it, it works. He's holding her there. Right, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, layout and yet it also ties into the story and I think that's uh, just as, as powerful and as important as you were saying. And, and you know, if you mentioned that one, I think that illustrates how good George Perez is because look how many characters are there and it's not cluttered. I've seen people that um, they don't know to prioritize when you talked about illustration before, you have to prioritize. Everybody can be the same size. And also, uh, Todd McFarlane said that if you have everything in the same size, then it's uh, boring, basically, because you're not, you know, he, he talked about music. And he, he said that uh, you have to, you want to go up and down and up and down. So if everybody's the same size, now, George Perez on that cover was amazing because you see Superman, Supergirl, a lot, a lot of people in the background, but they don't bother. And they still make it more powerful. It made, made a great background. And that's, by the way, one of the things I have to say for a lot of people I've been in touch with, uh, you should think how the background moves the story forward and not just a placeholder. I see so many people that they don't understand the benefit of a good background. It, both in illustrations and in uh, comic books, children's books, it's the same thing, even storyboards. Right, it, it's, it does so much to inform the reader and it's, it's something that can, you know, by the, the, either having too little, the story now is, is un. Uh, I guess unengaging, uh, uh, and if it's too cluttered, then you lose focus on the characters and what they're doing. So it's that delicate balancing act. True. Uh, and that's again that's right. why someone like Perez is going to make it look so easy because he seems oh, to he have makes that, it look so that easy. sense of, of knowing where everything should go. Now you had mentioned that um, you've you've written uh, Upside Down World, which is um, uh, a children's book. Could you tell yeah. us a, a little bit about that? Well, the, the idea of Upside Down World is is that each picture can be turned 180 degrees and then you you get another picture. So we did a book that basically, we did three books, that you start from one side, you read till the end, you turn it around and start again. And the credit here is to my wife, it was her idea. She's a graduate of Betzalel, and, uh, which is an art academy, and, and she was one year an exchange student in, in the Paris, in uh, the Beaux-Arts in Paris, which is, was great. Um, so my wife said, you know, children, um, they like the book to, we have five kids and they like and when they were little they wanted the book to be read again and again and again if it's a good book read it again read it again so we did w the idea of the book here is that you read it and you go back and forth and one of I've seen um, some comic books that have tried to do that not of high quality I uh, one day when I have time I've done some drawing upside down drawing stuff like that but it's interesting because you read it one way and when you turn it around and the pictures are uh, pretty unique yeah, I was looking uh, on the web, and I see that you have a, an Indiegogo uh, page set up. I'm not sure if no, that's... No, that was, that was uh, in 2014. And in the middle of the campaign, I, I had to go to a client in China. That was, uh, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was I, going to say... We're so, not raising money for it. But it was, it was interesting because you had a, a promotional video on the, on the site. Right. Right. Um, and it, it highlighted the concept pretty well. And I think a lot of parents would agree that having to watch the same movie over and over again, uh, you know, Finding Dory or something like that, the first time is fine, but the 18th time you, you want to pull your hair out. Uh, so uh, I, I, took, I took my kids to Smurf several times. I can tell you all the movie by heart. I know what you mean. Um, so I'm assuming that your wife uh, was thinking about that uh, when she was doing this. So um, with this book series, uh, what sort of reception were you able to get? Oh, pretty good reception. Um, people were interested in it. But to tell the truth, I, we didn't push it very much because my real interest is in making comic books and graphic novels. That's what I want to do for, for the next few years, hopefully. Um, people liked it. They liked it uh, for educational. We have some. We had some educational institute, museums, even from the states approaching us, stuff like that. <coughs> One day I hope to do a comic book uh, that, that has to do with that, with Upside Down World. I have the story layout, but that takes a lot of work as you know since you've done everything by hand and I'm really impressed with that but I wanted to touch about something that you said now and I think that's very important um, you know uh, McCarthy in marketing uh, he, he mentioned the four P's yeah. one of them is product and I always ask students um, when I was asking to define marketing they say it's uh, advertising or sales and they think about sleazy salesmen but one of the things you have to do is is uh, as the American Marketing Association uh, says, is, is to create value for the clients, for society even, and stuff like that. So 
you have to think of your crowd when you're doing a book because that's true. Um, and I'll, I'll get back into the, what I said about the background a second earlier. Who's going to read your book? It's not just going to be the kid. It's going to be their parents. Uh, take take a guy like uh, Tex Avery, who did, uh, you know, he developed Bugs Bunny. He created Duffy Duck. He did a lot of stuff, Warner Brothers and so forth. Uh, he knew that he always had two crowds. So the little kids would sit and they would do cartoons, and the older kids, 13 or their parents, would laugh about all the, you know, the soaks, the jokes and innuendos that were there. I saw once a play many years ago that they knew that, and they, they were using double meaning of some words to make, uh, um, you know, some jokes for the, for the parents. Now, if you're going to do a children's book, a parent is going to be reading it, an older brother, somebody else is going to bring it. So let's go, take that to the background. Put something interesting in the background that the kid may not notice, but the parent will enjoy, and, you, and, you, and the book is to make people um, come back again and again and again to it. Uh, so that's that's my view on that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned that because um, I have students who are uh, young enough to have grown up with either SpongeBob or The Simpsons, and they'll talk about you know when I watched that episode again as a as an adult, <coughs> uh, I didn't realize that there was that you know there was a joke about uh, sex or there was a an innuendo about oh, marijuana yeah. oh, or yeah. something. Um, so it is interesting because there is that 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 double audience that you're trying to reach. Um, so if you're writing this. Uh, this book, how do you keep the parents interested in this as well as the kids? Well, you know, one of the things that helped me was being a lecturer when, you, when I had to lecture to, to crowds. And I learned that you, what you do is integrate those jokes. Uh, you, you say stuff. You have to keep it all the time. And the best thing to do is also test it. Let people read and react. And one thing I have to tell all the young creators, put your ego aside in the sense that, you know, I just talked before on Skype to one of my dearest friends. His name is Herman Sperling. He's in the States. Uh, I don't know, North Carolina, not far from me. He used to be until New York recently. He was, until a couple of years ago, a senior VP at Harmon, which is a Fortune 500 company. He was on eBay's advisor board, amazing mentor of mine. Uh, and I brought him about two, three years ago. I was lecturing a graduate degree here in Israel. And uh, I brought him a, you know, to give a guest lecture via Skype, much like we're doing. And he asked the students, what's the most important thing for a salesman? They gave all these ideas. And then he tell them the most important thing is to be able to listen. You have to think of your audience. And if you could write something that's so clear to you, you know, you're an expert yourself in World War II, you write something that everybody knows this about World War II, and they don't get it that way. So when people, you know, I've seen a lot of great writers and artists, they always listen to the market in the sense they're not trying to do just something commercial that will sell. Because Bob McLeod told me something else, and I think he's so right about this. Everything in comic books has to be with clarity. It has to be clear. And, it, you know, to us, when we write something, it's so clear, it's so obvious. You know, you've been in the story for, for maybe working at, you know how much it takes. It's not like you, I've seen comic books, you know, you draw a plane on, on the ocean. So it didn't take you five minutes to draw this. I know it takes time. Even when you do it, whether you do it digitally, whether you do it by hand, it takes time. Uh, uh, comics is a labor-intensive work. So, you know, so you have to make sure it's clear and, and things that are clear to us. So if people read it and they tell you, you know, it's not clear or they understand the opposite of what you wanted to say, change it. Don't say, you know, you know, that's it. And all the great people that I've seen, all the great writers and I've been in touch with many, they always let some friends read it. But it has to be, um, how can I say it? Not your mother that will say, oh, this is great, Marty. This is, yeah, this is beautiful. You know, whatever you do, you, you'll send something that's horrible. It's people that will give you, if you can find someone that gives you really constructive criticism, and, and in a good way, uh, then you're lucky. That he or she is worth their weight in gold. Not somebody, you know, some people are, the way they do offer criticism is, is they, they can bring you down, you know? Uh, Greg Capullo always talks about how he met Larry Hama and they had a whole fight, and I, I suggest have your people, you know, I suggest look at it online. He, he said it a few times, and, and they really had a fight, and Larry Hama told him, go be a truck driver, and he was so mad. And, but then he said, after a few years, I had knowledge, and I, I saw he was right. You know, he was telling me good stuff. But it's the way you say it. You can't, if I tell you, you know, you're horrible, then you stop listening. So yeah. I think, it, so find that person, that would be great. It, it is it's something that I tell my students in uh, television production courses that, you know, you should always get feedback either from your peers. Your mother is always going to say it's great because, you know, that's what moms do. Uh, but you should also, um, you know, take what they say with a grain of salt because you will have some people who are either, you know, going to just tell you it stinks and then you'll have some people who tell you how to make it better. So you have to sort of 
find the right audience. But without that sense of, of balance, it's very hard for you to get any better. Well, I, uh, last year I was uh, I went to Andy Smith's Comics Experience, uh, and I was there, and I got feedback from you know uh, DC comic book artists, Marvel comic book artists, my peers, and you know again I came in uh, with some knowledge, but I left with much more, and that's why you know. Uh, I highly recommend a place like that. You can, you can go to other places online. There's free places also, uh, and and people give you feedback. But not but you also have to take all feedback with a grain of salt. You know, it's, it's got to be people that you hold in respect and do it in the right way. Absolutely. Now um, I had some <coughs> questions. Now you're also uh, uh, an entrepreneur, as we said at the beginning of the program. Um, and one of the things from what I was able to gather from your website is that you help uh, organizations um, become more successful. So I was wondering if, if you could apply that to uh, an up-and-coming cartoonist, someone who wants to get his or right. her work out yeah, into definitely. the market. How, how would you uh, offer advice to someone? Well, first of all, let me say that I've taken people from an idea on a napkin to an exit on the American stock exchange like the NASDAQ. So I've, I've seen it from, from you know, an M&A, mergers and acquisition. I've seen it all. And we have clients uh, from in the States, Canada, all over Europe, Africa and even China and Singapore. So, so much like I work with you now, uh, but uh, I work with them on Skype usually. I've got some clients that I've never met face to face. Um, now, a lot of people that come to comic books are really, really great artists. I've seen some of these young guys that are that are amazing. They have self discipline, and you know they learned they went to study art at SCAD um, or, or you know anywhere else that's really good. Uh, at uh, Kubert uh, School, Kubert School, uh, they went to study and they know the art, you know, you know, um, and they they know the art process really well. But they're going to be freelancers now, and that means you're a business, and they have to treat themselves as a business. Now, what's the rule of a business? First of all, you say, okay, what's your objective? Do you want to grow? You know, do you want to do you have a multi-million dollar business, or do you want to just stay home and draw comic books? But you, you're you're going to have to be responsible if you're freelance for your taxes for your social benefits, and for marketing yourself. Now, a lot of people from art, um, when you talk about marketing, it's like, oh my, they're talking as if they're, they're, they've been, you know, it's like, 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 like it's prostitution, literally. What, I have to sell myself? Yes, you do. And uh, you have to know, um, I call it being in marketing shape. Now, what's the common, most common mistakes, mistakes I see in all companies, not just, uh, small companies they put a lot of time in developing the product because they're enthusiastic about the product now it could be a, an application for something it could be cancer research or it could be a comic book but they're all products and people are going to buy them now if nobody knows let's say you have this amazing store it's really amazing it's the best store ever but nobody knows it exists it's only open on saturdays and four in the morning and it's on the 13th floor someplace who's going to get there so you have to start putting things out and you know, today you have Patreon that can get you money uh, from people that support you and allow you to do, but you have to invest time in it. So I'm not, not saying 50% of your time, but come on, 10, 20% of the time, and it has to be consistently. For example, I've seen a lot of artists that they say, we're going, every week we're going to post, post something on Twitter or uh, some other uh, website, and they don't. So they lose their crowd. So you have to be consistent, and you have to consistently put time and effort into it. And what I said before, what Herman says about listening, you have to, to do feedback. What I would recommend someone is, look, there's different crowds and different websites. So what you have to do is go out initially on a lot of them and find a way to get feedback, which one is more works for you best, and then invest more time in that channel. And if the channel goes down, don't be attached to it. Move to another channel. But you have to put time into it. <coughs> if I was... If someone now finished an undergraduate degree in uh, in art, wants to be a comic book artist, I would tell him uh, or her, go do an MBA in business administration. That will be so beautiful for you because it will complete your training. You're going to be a freelance. Uh, learn how to negotiate a contract. You know, Neil Adams, um, who have had the privilege of speaking with a little bit over the phone, uh, Neil Adams, he said some stuff that I would recommend about negotiating a deal, you know, that he came in initially when he was young and he said, uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I'll give it more or less. He said, I said, I'm going to do a cover and, and uh, I wanted $600 for it. And the guy said, well, we can't pay you less than 2000 
So find out how much they're willing to pay. You know, do, and the information is all online. You know, a uh, great website is uh, Jim Zub uh, site. Gives a lot of information. He's a great writer. Does the comic book for Image and <coughs> also for the major publishers. And he's got a lot of information there. But learn the how to sell your type of marketing. Everything has a crowd. Everyone has a crowd. I'm not saying not to do something you love. This is really important. Do something that you love, that you believe in. You know, all, all people that said that they were successful, when they stopped looking, trying to, um, to do something that other people will like, if you understand mm -hmm. what I mean. They, they, they tried, they did what they love. But if your crowd doesn't know it, how can you reach them? So you have to locate where your crowd is. Is it in the States? Is it out of the States? Is it international or not? What age is the age group? Is it for older people? You know, is it for younger? And then try to reach that crowd and invest uh, time on a weekly basis. And you have, should have fixed hour for this. You know, really set time apart for marketing. If you don't, what happens is to all businesses, they, they have to get some work like from a publisher. They have a work for the next half a year. All of a sudden, they don't. Right. Well, I see we have about a minute left of, of our conversation. Um, uh, if someone is, is looking to get more information, is there a way that they could uh, reach out to you and, and maybe uh, pick your brain? Or, or is there a website that you'd recommend for uh, oh, young artists? Have, first of all, they can always contact me at uh, madi at brightnet.biz or uh, brightnet.biz, that's a website, all my contact details there. They can approach me on LinkedIn, I'm very approachable and uh, I'd be delighted to talk to people and help and stuff like that. I've done some co-created comic books with people, so I'm always interested in that. Uh, yeah, that'd, that'd be a delight. And uh, I can't wait to see your comics, The Agreement, when it's finished. It's, it's getting better every time. Well, uh, the new page should be launched uh, a little later on this afternoon, so you could look for that. And I appreciate the feedback that you gave me on that first issue. Uh, but I really do believe good. that we are out of time right now. Uh, so, Morty, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today, for taking time out of your schedule. I know it's very late at night there. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank you so much for being with us today. And I'd like to thank uh, those of you at home for watching uh, Comic Culture. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.